indigo, amaranth, magenta, willow, dusk. You have to choose when to layer, when to darken. You want the angle of the light, the direction of its falling to be consistent. This is how you give depth to a figure that has only warmth and a finite amount of time. This is how you make them believe you. His hands kneading the dough for the bread maker we will use every week for one year exactly. His snoring with a dog ear recertification exam book yelling on his lap while the rain picks off needles from the evergreen. The way Rose hasn't left the rims of our eyes since we arrived. He doesn't give up talking to God. At some point, I think he must begin to suspect it's a one-way conversation, though he still insists that a choice not aligned with God's will is a mistake. In other words, a choice is not a choice, or it is something you have to pay for. At least the performance of a conversation is free. God is a poem to recite over and over when one feels what one desires eviscerates in the morning air. He kneels on the freshly vacuumed balding carpet in a freezing room with emerald window panes, holding our hands saying, Father. The bus she rides to the mountains is cobalt. Then for 12 hours, she horseshoes her spine over a silver desk one of hundreds of women who have shed their tribes, families, languages, their old weapons to cross the ocean to be counted among the fluorescent angels of capitalism. On our way home, an asteroid splashes on the face of the earth. Believe it or not, this happens every day. You have every color before you and the margins of every page in your school notebook asking for a more radiant life. He won't go to bed until you are done because you might make a mistake. The coloring pencils, oil-based, the only things in the apartment not purchased from a thrift shop, a thrift store or a garage sale are non-erasable. Of course, he cannot help you. You are not a poet. You are making a wolf. You are making a hatchet. Art of the Revision from Cynthia Dewey, uh, Oka, and her latest book, Fire is Not a Country. So good evening and welcome to Philly Loves Poetry, a collaboration between the Moonstone Arts Center of Philadelphia and Philly Cam. The focus of our program is to give our audiences the experience of the rich culture of uh, poetry in the city of Philadelphia. And, and tonight we, we really have a very special guest, someone who has done much to nurture the love of poetry in the city of Philadelphia and be, beyond. And that is our, our special guest, Cynthia Dewi Oka. Cynthia was born in Bali, Indonesia. And when she was 10, her family migrated to Vancouver, unceded coast Salish territories. Since 2012, Cynthia has been based in the greater Philadelphia area with her son and partner. Cynthia is the author of Fire Is Not a Country, which was published in 2021, and Salvage, which was published in 2017 by Northwestern Press, and Nomad of Salt and Hard Water, first published by Dinah Press in 2012, with a second edition of New and Revised Poem published by Thread Makes Blanket in 2016. In, uh, in 2020, uh, Cynthia is the 2021-22 poet in residence at the Amy Clampett House in Lenox, Massachusetts. She has been awarded the Leeway Foundation's Transformation Award, the Tupelo uh, Quarterly Poetry Prize, and the fifth Wendy Wednesday Journal Editor's Prize in Poetry. Cynthia is an alum of Voices of Our Nations workshop and the Vermont Studio Center, and she earned her FMFA as a Houghton Minority Scholar at Warren Wilson College. 
She has taught at several places. Uh, she has taught creative writing at Bryn Mawr College, New Mexico State University, and various literary organizations um, such as the Murphy Writing of Stockton University, the Blue Stoop, and the Asian Arts Initiative, with whom she partnered in the aftermath of the 2016 election to offer Sanctuary, a migrant poetry workshop for immigrant poets based in Philadelphia. And it was actually a workshop uh, that was featured on Philly Loves Poetry in the same year, 2016. Uh, Cynthia has served as a visiting distinguished waiter at Widener University, conducted workshops and readings at Princeton, Penn, the New School, NYU, Swarthmore, and Williams College. Cynthia is a creative facilitator. She has authored workshops for a wide range of organizations, including community building artworks, free write prison writing group, Women Writers in Bloom, Women's Mosul Museum, and Training for Change. She has worked with young poets in high schools across New Jersey as a Geraldine Dodge poet. In 2021, Cynthia led a week-long intensive workshop for emerging Indonesian writers in collaboration with UBUD, Writers and Readers Festival, and the International Writing Program of the University of Iowa. Cynthia has performed her poetry in various uh, venues, both uh, locally in the United States and internationally. For 15 years, Cynthia has worked as an organizer, trainer, and fundraiser in social movements for gender, racial, and economic and migrant justice. In 2020, she transitioned out of the nonprofit se sector to focus on her artistic practice. As an immigrant and former young single mother with working class roots, her aesthetics are guided by her core values, self-determination, collaboration, and attention to the peripheral. She writes to be free. So welcome, Cynthia. Thank you so much for having me, um, Charles. And uh, I'm gonna start with a poem. Suhitsu with love for the moon's failed rebellion. You showed me a long winding road that cut through a tapestry of frost. The refinery's rust armored cylinders rising from massive defeated grass. Smoke had stopped writing letters and the workers with oil in their ears are now elsewhere illusory bouncing grandbabies on arthritic knees. Florida, probably. I put my lipstick on before I looked for the world. That room made of moon and metal guesses. The desk brain abandoned. Like your hand, Klingons are approaching the home planet, resolved to defend their heat to no one. We do not have the luxury of principles says Starfleet Admiral Cornwell. My principles crept horizontally as frost would. I wanted to leave the world racing with flies, a cord over the normal river where one brother would squat to take a shit 10 feet down from the other scrubbing his armpits with ash. That is all we have, says Starfleet mutineer Michael Burnham, because she knows even in Black Panther, it is nobility that wins the day. Who wouldn't gladly trade the frosty ballot box for a damp room with a beaded curtain and a $10 massage at any time of day on any corner of Denpasar streets? Effortless. Unlike the striving husband who drops her off by the lilied entrance because he doesn't think women should drive. She steps out of her clothes in air black as a lily, lies face down, and within minutes, consciousness is a question of pressure. Where, how deep, how close to bleed. If you speak, it means you remember, writes Kimiko Han. After the footage ended, the refinery was pressurized tundra. I am not a democracy or my mother in her intact stratosphere. My childhood friends, long and moneyed, debate whether to cut one more fold or stab 
to better shade the moon, another row of lashes, one by one, into the skin of their eyelids. The villa did not ask for air conditioning because it had no walls. Prime altitude, voices like tigers crouched behind mahogany beams. I wept like a staircase, widening at the bottom for purely aesthetic reasons. The lipstick was already on you. I marked you, the world, without your consent. Morgana, Callisto, Koba, Killmonger, are you there? I reserve my love for the antagonists whose pain is moonlight spilled on the dead factories. The speaker is linked to the writer by a tenuous string of spit. She hums like a microwave, walking toward that pool of moon where her father stands, the mouth in his face aglow. Her government, ready for the rebellion to turn on itself. Accusation that looks like slut, but the moon bottles it up. I choose and cherish all that will perish, argues June Jordan, the living deal, from which there is no coming back. In Singapore, several aisles in a single drugstore are dedicated wholly to skin bleaching products. The father suspects something. His wife has sold too many shoes. She keeps the most coveted pair, ivory, for herself as is her way. She can't even wear them. So broken is the skin of her souls from years of walking barefoot on dung and crushed brick on the way to and back from the market, defending her mother's little plastic bags of homemade soy sauce. In a rare season of certainty, I use the last of my credit to visit an exploded planet. Pressure of a Killian magnitude pulverized debris to the finest of an eyelash. My normal life ended the second my parents put me on that ship, says Supergirl to a wide-eyed Jimmy Olsen after punching the carburetor right out of the car. Normal is losing, then losing some more. Your hand is being filled with the Holy Spirit having what others desire and you can't escape. My mother carries her secret, useless shoes everywhere. Why do you eat so fast, she chides, like the devil is right behind you. The sun, a leather black rose, over the slapping of knife on bread in the kitchen, my lipstick set to announce its last will and testament. On the Lunar New Year, your hand weighs, I have no idea what. I wanted to say, yes, I'll float with you. I love the short circuiting under your suit, the lying design, but couldn't break out of the moon my father fermented. Nearing climax, a door scorched like a word that remembers nothing. It is snowing in my eyelashes which is to say, forgive me. I was born a hammer tapping on a lock. The hammer did not hope to open it. It just wanted to hear a song, any songs, primal, inexplicable evil. They made a machine to make climate change happen where white people don't live, says my Lyft driver. And I'm Puerto Rican. Don't. My knee is a child filled with worms. It would seem the noblest of us have made of throne a mercy, yielding to the rust hearted, mongers and mongrels, not arms, but panoramas of the believable, believable world never to be seen again beneath acres of frost, how moonlight. That is really something <laughs> exquisite. Um, 
as I said to you when I discussed my experience of your book, that that poem opened up so much to me beyond just this book. I say to me personally, per, as, mm -hmm. a, as, a, as a poet myself, and I guess it, it's a sense of, of freedom that is portrayed there. And it, but it's not random freedom. It's a very guided, you know, kind of freedom that I see in that poem, the way it's built and structured. Um, so, could you first discuss a this the the style itself? But I also saw this style while it's not mentioned uh, in other poems. I saw it very evident throughout throughout the book. So, could you just discuss that, Zuitsu? Yes, I. It's incredibly insightful, I think, actually, for you to sort of recognize the larger movement of the book inside of that poem, um, because I think that's absolutely true. I think the poem behaves. It's like a microcosm of how the book behaves. Um, and so the, the suhitsu is um, a form that is very interesting. It is a Japanese form, actually. And, um, and the whole point is it is kind of like, um, it, it is a form that encourages freedom because it encourages sort of juxtaposition, um, sort of uh, whimsy, randomness. Like you can, they're kind of like, um, you can include like, they're like fragmented, um, it's like fragmented essays or like snippets mm -hmm. um, that kind of enact a poet's response to the world immediately around her. And so the form itself um, sort of kind of has this, you know, um, explosive quality because it is not, I mean, you know, I've, I've written sonnets, I've written gazels and like, it's a very different sort of um, constraint actually to practice freedom. Like, I think that is the, that's what's so interesting about the form because you have to decide the parameters of your consciousness and your attention um, and how you define the world that is around you. And I think that was like the first thing that came to challenge me is that um, I don't have one world around me. Um, I have multiple worlds around me. I have multiple, and like those multiple worlds contain multiple times. Um, and it includes like where I come from. It includes where I have been, where I am now. It also includes like all of the, the TV shows and the books that I'm reading. Like this is all kind of like my surroundings. Um, and I think like the way that, uh, so I, what I wanted to do with the poem in particular was think about like, what's the thing that is most difficult for me to say that I feel sort of like the the deepest self censorship around, you know, because the the poems in the the form's invitation is to kind of break out of that, um, in, in part because it liberates you from having to kind of like write linearly, um, and I think for me uh, the concerns that are like reflected in that poem is like, you know, it speaks to the concerns of the whole book. Um, I think about the sacrificed. I think about um, the people who get thrown under the bus <laughs> um, in sort of um, not just, it's like it's in, it's in the way that we think about what is right, in the way that we think about um, what is true and good, you know, so, uh, the, like, characters that were, like, named in it, you know, uh, like, Koba, uh, from Planet of the Apes, <laughs> Killmonger from, from Black Panther, Callisto, actually, from, like, my favorite series of all time, Xena Warrior Princess, um, mm -hmm. they are characters who, uh, who, who, are, who embody our pain, who embody our suffering, who embody our rage um, at the injustices that we have suffered, and they always lose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think about this a lot. It's like um, there is a kind of, I think that, like, as 
the narrative of progress, the narrative of healing, the narrative of freedom can sometimes be actually really damaging, can sometimes be really injurious because um, they don't make room, right? They don't necessarily make room for um, pain to continue. Mm -hmm. But pains continue. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like if you, if one has been um, a sufferer of chronic conditions, like I have, um, or like when one as a child experiences like a really primary separation from their homeland, like I did, um, that pain continues. There is no solution to it. Mm -hmm. It's like part of the thing that we carry. So I think part of the insistence of this poem and of this book is that I choose and cherish all that will perish. Like I choose, like I I choose to claim that this pain too is precious. Mm -hmm. that, it, that we don't just get to throw it away. That we don't just get to say like this is a thing that needs to be corrected. Um, yes. So okay. I'll well, yeah. That, so speaking uh, about that, I mean that was one form. But I mean, you, I mean, the, the book is exciting also because it, you know, it offers so many different ways for you to say and communicate, you know, what you want to and to give you freedom. I mean, the uh, four, I think it's four short, what I call them short plays, were, which are really wonderful. And then the five uh, protege uh poems and how you know both of those interact as well as you have you know ex examples of you know concrete poetry there's so much in here in what 90 90 some pages i mean it seems so much longer and bigger a book than the pages give credit for so could you discuss the the purpose of those forms and how they served you in, in addressing, uh, you know, these questions and these uh, situations that you want to address. Uh, so you're asking specifically about the screenplays and right. the, and the, the protege. protege. Right. That's a great question. So the proteges were actually one poem. It was like originally it was a five part poem. Um, and it was first given a home actually um, by a Philly based journal, uh, Scoundrel Time. Um, Daisy Freed edits that. And um, what's interesting was, you know, I think that like it was a poem in which I was like thinking about the ways I, I spent so much of my life being like, I will not be like my father. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, but and at the time of writing this, you know, I was uh, I was organizing with um, undocumented Indonesians in Philadelphia, um, and that experience like really forced me to kind of like reckon to confront a lot of like the fears that um, I grew up saturated in, like this fear of like what it means to like live being unwanted, like in a place. Um, and always like scared of like everyone around you. And um, I thought it made me kind of like think about my dad and I was just like, wow, like here I am sort of like in, like I am not unlike you, you know? And um, so it was a poem thinking about in the ways in which like I am, I am his daughter. Like I am like his child, his protege in mm -hmm. a way. Um, and trying to kind of like mine uh, the wisdom uh, as well as like, and like some of that wisdom is like difficult. Some of that wisdom I don't even agree with, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but I think that the experience a lot helped me to recognize it as a wisdom that I inherited. Mm -hmm. um, and what's really interesting was uh, when I, so the book was originally like the manuscript, it was like organized into sections, like in a much more traditional way. Mm -hmm. And then I had uh, a check-in with Parnisha, who is the uh, who who was my who's my editor at Northwestern, and she was like, you know what? She's like, this is a, a manuscript of disruption, and like, I don't know if you need sections. Mm -hmm. um, 
And her saying that, it like blew the book up. Like it just blew it up in the best way possible. I like completely reorganized everything, restructured everything. Um, and I realized that the protégés could function as a kind of thread throughout the book. Um, like because there's so much of the book that it threatens to veer away, right? To like, it's like, it's a, it's a book that goes like this. Mm -hmm. because that's my experience like that's yeah. super, that's very intentional like that's what it feels like to be like a resident alien you know mm -hmm. it's like yeah. you're constantly being torn um mm -hmm. or like stretched across contexts and um but like it was wonderful to have protege be able to kind of form a spine for the book in that way and then the screenplays well, the thing was that like so much of these poems were, I mean, they were written in moments of like incredible heartbreak, um, I think for me, and just like, and a lot of like terror. Um, this was like, they were all written during like the, the, the Trump years. And, um, and I really, when I, when I got to the end i was just like i don't want to write any more poems like i really kind of like feel sick of the like i it felt like the po like poetry was not enough like i was like i wanted to do more and i also wanted to expand the frame of the book if mm -hmm. that makes sense from kind of like the you know um uh, from like its thematic concerns i wanted to um because in in many ways like this is the this is like my most intimate work and i have um a commitment to like frame expansion like it's just like it's like a it's like a politic and an ethic for me and i found that um the screenplay form i'm like I, i'm a big cinemaphile um really helped me to do that because they they're complete like they they don't involve the speaker right mm -hmm. they involve completely other characters but again there's like this kind of um consistent for me um desire to like offer dramatic attention to figures, um, to lives that we forget about. Like there is no apocalypse movie that features like immigrant aunties. Mm -hmm. And immigrant aunties like carry so much of this country's economy, but they don't show up in The Walking Dead. Mm -hmm. Like that's not, you know, um, so, or like they don't show up in like Armageddon. <laughs> like whatever so i wanted to kind of offer dramatic attention to like well what what does apocalypse mean to like people who have been living in an apocalyptic manner mm -hmm. <laughs> so for example in like one of the screenplays like that the one i was just ref referencing um the one with the aunties like facing the end of the world you know they're like they're like it's our last day of work we're gonna drink we're gonna eat dinner, <laughs> we're gonna dress yeah, up yeah. We're gonna talk about you know, and um, I wrote that one with my mom, actually. So it's written, the dialogue is written in her English. And then there's like other ones. There's like one with like dentists, like holding presidential, <laughs> like candidates accountable <laughs> um, yeah. at debates. Um, but, and, you know, I wanted to kind of, and these dentists are like, like, I mean, the founders, like the Southeast Asian dentists, because like Southeast Asians are so incredibly like invisibilized um, in the American context, even inside of the umbrella of like Asian Americanness. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like, I think it's, uh, I wanted to play. Um, I wanted to give myself like a lot of these poems, like took me, like a lot of these poems ask me to dwell in mm -hmm. difficult things. And mm -hmm. I wanted to give myself um, permission to play, to like be like a child again, to kind of like reclaim innocence in the act of making. And mm -hmm. that's what came out. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting that you say that because I, I, there was a review mm -hmm. uh, of the book. It was, a, I think it was a, a group that meets that the that, that uh, and the the facilitator described your book and she talked about i believe those things as specified experiments and i took issue with it because i didn't see them as experiments oh. i saw them really to be honest with you wonderful inter interruptions oh. they gave you time to r really focus on on that this little play 
or the, or movie or whatever you want to call it, yeah. that is it, that is right there, and then you move on, and then it, it appears again, and it's it, it's like a chorus. It's like a chorus is you know that, that has come out. It's you know so classical in that sense. So I didn't say I said this. I'm sorry, but I don't see them as experiments. I don't see anything in this book as an experiment. To be honest with you, mm-hmm. I see it. I see it almost like and I mentioned it to somebody else in, to who I interviewed. Is that it's like that bi- those biology books that had you know at least in my time they had these transparencies and you layer them and layer them above the body and then, and, and then you see the organs and then you see the you see the bones and you see the 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 the, the, the blood vessels etc and all of a sudden you see a whole human being I mean yeah. from a biological standpoint a physiological standpoint so that's why I, I that's a, you know the way I I see this book. Mm. Is this layering, this layering of, of so much of that, and so, I, you know, I, I really, I don't see that. And a number of places, um, is the stance you take as a poet. I mean, even in the last, po- the poem that I read, yeah. the very, the very last part, you know, the very last part, which you know mentions Wolf, and mentions Hatchet. You're not a poet. But I said, I think Simpson is saying something much that this is it. Listen, well, is that is that is that uh, accurate to say that that uh, Cynthia is wolf <laughs> has, <laughs> this, <laughs> has that that quality in it, but also the hatchet. I mean, this is a, a you know exquisite book of poetry. But to introduce those two images, I said, well, you know, in a way that fits here. There's a lot of that in here. Right. Um, uh, I feel like I feel very full in my heart because um, you are such an ideal reader. <laughs> like, it's uh, I wanted to quickly respond to what you were saying around like uh, the interludes being interruptions. I think I mean, that's right. That's exactly right. Um, that is exactly how intent I intended them in terms of like where they are. They were an interruption like process wise when I was writing them they were an interruption into like my usual process you know right. I, and in the book they serve as interruptions as like bridges but also exactly that as a layering as like this kind of like there's another level mm-hmm. um and in terms of those five the final lines of the book which is you are not a poet you are making a wolf you are making a hatchet um you know, I think I the even the identity of poet is like something like I mean there is on one level like the fact that I I even I struggle even still like with that identity um poetry being I think in many ways sort of the highest form of a language mm-hmm. and um in terms of what English has meant to me in my life um mm-hmm as something that was a compulsory um, imposition that felt violent in my mind. It's like there is a kind of friction with that, you know, with what it means to then like practice this form that Mm -hmm. uses the materiality of the English language as its Mm -hmm. building blocks. Um, So I think there's like, there's a way in which like, that is what I mean when I say you are not a poet, especially in the context of that poem, right? Mm -hmm. Mm and then there's like another way in which it me what I me, what I think I'm intending is you are not just a poet. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like you cannot be reduced to a poet um, mm-hmm. because your project is larger. Your project is to make a wolf, um, which to me, you know, it's like a, a like the the wolf for me like signifies um, this incredible tension between wildness between like just freedom and loyalty mm-hmm. because they're pack animals mm-hmm. right um mm-hmm. and and interdependence so like i think there's that um and the hatchet which you can both use to tear things down and to build things up mm-hmm. you can also use hatchets to kill a wolf mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. I think, wow. I, um, wow. yeah, 
So I think about all like that's what's in those three. Yeah. <laughs> I I would say you know I I, w I would really like to move to you know mm -hmm. reading reading these 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 some of your poems or at least a selection of them, but I would say to anybody, please buy this book. It is if you want if you want a book of poems as an experience, okay. This is what it is. It's an experience. It's not just to like hey, let me just throw through these and kind of making a self definition is much more than that. It is an ex it, it is experiencing poetry. And I don't know how to put it any other way. So, but the floor is yours because I know our audience wants to hear you read more poems. Mm. Thank you so much, Charles. And we must be on the same wavelength um, because you asked about the protege poems and I picked a few of them to read tonight. And I'm actually gonna start with one. Protégé, part one. The street between the subway station and the church is narrow. Cars beaded along both sides like rosaries. God in his hurry to the rain's press conference had forgotten on top of the sock drawer. Sidewalks like teeth crammed into two small gums, hustling each other for drops of sugar rot. Go on darkening cracking for miles under the raw home stiff red lips until they are touching the glass intestines, center city, Philadelphia. An easier metaphor than the, than the dentist's office, where I was safe once among the white clay molds and scalpel, a desk clear of debris and spiderless walls where shadows played the frangipani's romance against an iron twilight. My father, who was calm then and spotless as he excised from mouths the roots of injury. He had, of course, his magic tricks, like asking a seven-year-old what the number of Israel's tribes times itself is, and while she tries to recall a desert she has never seen and the sea behind it, which she has, and how many names could be hiding in the grains of sand that bind the seen to the unthinkable, pulling out with a flick of the wrist so quick it, the baby tooth, like childhood itself, might not have existed at all, were it not for the whole tasting of iron and twilight, its truth called now in the clearest jar of alcohol, maudlin almost under the plastic Christ's painted damage, glancing off other primeval truths, pre-cavity, boiled egg white, never to be part of her speech again. This poem is called Elegy with a White Shirt and there is like one um, reference in it that I wanted to explain um, there's a line here about the people in my homeland wearing white um, to signify readiness to die. So there's a history behind that. Um, in Bali in the early um, 20th century, uh, when the Dutch finally came and like blockaded the last standing kingdoms, um, Badung and Kulungkung on Bali, um, this was like in 1908, um, around that time. Um, because the Balinese people were fierce people and they had will they basically had um, been able to like repel um, occupiers uh, for for a very long time um, when these kingdoms were about to fall the Balinese um, people and the royal courts they actually they knew that they couldn't stand you know against like cannons and bayonets and all of this stuff um, and they all dressed up in white and um, did what's called the practice of puputan and that is mass suicide. And um, because they would rather die than sort of um, kneel to the Dutch. Elegy with a white shirt. The way we waited for the year to end made me think of walking backward under a mandrake sky, cloth rough and hot with my own breath on my cheeks as the hill began to resemble an eyelid the line of men in black, shields pressed side by side like a howl spelled out its lashes. In the solid lake, 
One of the shadows had started a fire. Heavy things spilled across the asphalt. I remember thinking I knew what violence was. Verdicts left under stones in my body and how specific the shapes I could fold into in the cold of a wrong train. How electrifying those veins appearing in the window, the city's false sleep, lashes separating as they swept down toward the dark mass in which I was one strand of smoke. That was years ago in another country where as a rule, people carried rain inside them like small hammers. In Orozco's combat, it's a painting. A blade is thrust through the suggestion of a body inside a white shirt. I see a fist pushing the blade in and the blade coming clean through the bracket where the rib should be. There is no blood. The shirt is holding a line with other shirts, like a wave cresting backward against its own dark sea, pounding from the opposite shore, suggesting an endlessness to struggle and within fire's vanity. From behind, I see what the white shirts cannot. Faces afloat in the umbrage of raised blades, trying to make their way here. Maybe I am trying to make my way there. It is not always clear these days whether between here and there I am supposed to break or hold the line. In my homeland, the people wear white to signify readiness to die. My homeland lives like a witch in my house, turning the rice yellow and filling my mouth with marbles when my mother calls. She puts up strange lights in the air of my mind Sometimes they bark like dogs, and when the mask of gasoline sticks too zealously, I stop what I am doing to lick it. Under the white shirt, the wound is longer than any blood. Under the parade of the pure, the wind-defying veils of redemption, my bones suggest spill. I dig around them day and night for the poem as irrigation, myself as probable which is to say here, not there, part of the we, not sweeping bloodless liquidity time and again, some call bad magic and others, America. They everywhere is whomsoever we least believe. I've never seen the witch in my house in a white shirt. I've never seen her right, but her verdict I feel behind every line, burning, or not. For instance, mingling ashes with snow, wondering where my portion of pavement begins, and if today the kids at Burke's family detention center are mending their own snow people. Kids whose cards to Santa have found the guardian instead, questing that old burglar, pinnacle of red in whom grows fat, our love for the obsolete like wet fruit in jaws of snow. Para La Libertad. The ironclad irony sticks in an old hole in my ribs. On white paper, neon colored squiggles, erratic lines suggest stars, flowers, small hands of endless sea. Syndrome. I am still there in that hypothalamus, lightning stalking the banister. Rope, antiseptic, glacier, canvas where your petals lie drying. Like lips, I understand, don't go, it's a cruel thing. To ask with matches. Behind one ear, how a hand fists around a braid, trowel in the other. In moments of crisis, I wash my mouth. Twice daily, that prayer be laced with spearmint. On macadam, a girl flock jabbing their beaks, basketballs bouncing off chain, permanently accentuate I. One crumb of bread, communion thin. 
Like all waves we toss over the wall, God being ever is behind and the walls. Chalk in memory, I prefer it that way. A pastel Eden orbiting your cranium instead of faulty eyes, which can't. Tell monster from buckets clanging with rain, there, I am in that hangar, the night grass streaked with vomit on pounding red. Of your heart, though scorpion cloud rends foliage, what I remember is death of illumination in its cradle, moths falling like a veil over you, me, inside the cool. Rooflessness that stands on twisted, engine of your waist, I creak. With penumbra from the beginning, shard aspiring to dynamite. Dawn, the steeple thrust. There, in lightning antiseptic, glaciers drying, a cruel thing, how in the other I wash my mouth. Laced with a girl flock jabbing their beaks, one crumb of bread over the wall, God and chalk, a pastel Eden orbiting, can't. In that hangar streaked with vomit, foliage is death, like a veil over you, me, that stands on, engine of your waist, dynamite, the steeple thrust. Protégé, part three. People who live in South Philly may recognize some of these street names. <laughs> I like to take my time between the station and the church to nod at elders on their lawn chairs by the entrances of corner stores where everything from instant noodles to garden shears are sold by insomniacs who in another life were doctors radio hosts, kids throwing rocks at tanks and each other. To run my fingertips across the sun shattered on a chain link fence and the laughter behind it. I like to hear the brightness of my mother tongue like cans crushed into pavement and the parakeet green of streets announcing themselves like they've never carried a foreign passport. Good day, Morris. Have you noticed the mole growing on your broad? You might want to pierce it. So what if none of this is mine? Neither were the flying ants that broke the floor seams during rainy season. The lights would go out and the dark thrash with their hunger. I didn't know then what no one meant. I was happy in my terror when dirt feathered wings like the dead's fingernails brushed my eyelids and the insides of my thighs. All those years, I heard and misunderstood their plans, seeping through slits between the door and door frame that separated the front of the house, which belonged to us, God, family, the rotary phone's nuclear yellow. From the part without a toilet, where two girls from the village who washed swept, cooked, and whom I always thought of conveniently as immortal, wrote letters sometimes to mothers who might or might not still be alive. I'd offer to help when I felt like being a good person. And I did want to want to be a good person with the capacity to believe that the deep fried bulbs of ants served the morning after a storm with eggs and glasses of powdered milk really were seeds of the exotic pomegranate. That wings carpeting the floor like tiny drafts of ill-fated words, words simply asking for a breeze to shake the shapes out of them, might be elevated to some other destination than the dustpan, than baskets of fire cross-hatching the sky. But I was already learning how to live 
with all those bodies crowding my mouth. There was ever only light and more light after rain like that. Ode where milk was rare. Oh, what country. Aphrodisiac, even without her hair. Their praise, a pink thighed museum. Oh, unbearable roses. I sang to thorns in my wrists, throwing obdurate sand over my shoulder and into the new hollows galloped horses made of sugar. Oh, self-discovery. The sand wants it, slithering through bare toes. How aria everything I touch with the blue-green seams in my head. Oh, fumbling, brocaded benevolence, rides of the sea raised to foam, madness on the rocks. Make me anklets, make me parachute. I'm reading the poem mosquitoes make slap dead on a Coca-Cola night. Drink with me, shadows on the beach while from the pan a snake pours white in iron light. Oh, noons, I was left alone with a shovel beyond that line of coconut trees. After the funeral, a train of wax paper draped over wobbly footed tables, the red perfectly matching the towering golden Buddha's loincloth. Lips flap, planets wound around chopsticks unravel, drip bits of scallion, our fists fill with bulbs of cheap porcelain. After love, the patient parse of meat from bone, yoke from destiny. Kin do not recognize each other in this steaming nation. A mint leaf on my tongue makes me forget my tongue. Several languages eddy, their thorns snagging through rain's arrhythmia, misunderstanding our common feast. Auntie who runs circles around the Hell's Angels this side of town with her migrant English and smudge mascara jumps up after spilling bright orange fanta on her leather miniskirt. Uncle who can quote any passage from Corinthians on command waves his napkin at her moon thigh. I surrender, I surrender. Roses of Sri Racha. The wail of sad laughter rocks us on its salty back. It saves us this indecency. Beyond the glass doorfront, gray sonata of city, the juniper's judgment tearing at elbows. A boy with a dead man's name is stitching himself inside a just married teenage girl. She is laughing too as though she could still belong to anyone. The sun had rendered every pebble and worm like a confession on the opened ground. It cowers now while our oil slick teeth grow winter big. Have they forgotten, have I, to unbutton the hawk from the white and black keys of the piano to rewrite everything? All right, I'm gonna read one final poem. Um, Great. Thank you so much, Charles, for having me. And Philly Loves Poetry for hosting us. Protege part five. My father's signature began with a bald O the ink looping at its top before scrawling illegibly away from right to left. It looked like a worm wriggling its way into a mouth rounded by wonder. 
I practiced forging it as much for the pleasure as necessity. It didn't fit the way he crossed his arms while surveying the white tiles for fugitive strands of hair or how I paid for every dirt stain on my hand-me-down jeans with a berating. It was his claim to love Elizabeth Taylor, though his head would nod into his chest halfway through any one of her films. The sound of petals drying redly on his canvas, which rained over the dining room while volcanic ashes like mana rained. O dandruff of heaven, give us this day our daily transfiction, who are built of primary colors and childlike palms waving to every tourist for their magnificent scraps. He dreamed of windmills, the absence of dog shit in rivers we praised as a symbol of God's deliverance. One winter, he drove me and my sister to a Christmas tree plantation near the city limits in Richmond, British Columbia, where a scarlet windmill stood like a man struck by sudden, perfect understanding. Night was filing into gaps in the rows of fur like a reserve battalion or memory mixing with the patches of frozen mud were trunks in their green gowns, now being lashed onto the roofs of stationed wagons, had kept the snow from collecting, while false bells and true laughter chimed, and the moon, our one faith, rolled back its eye. My father pointed at the enormous frost-hushed blades above us and said, that is why we came. I could not forgive him for that. Not while he lived. Not when they thawed under spring's eagerness and still did not stir. He's somewhere else now, like snow emptied of the axis ringing, while I lose sleep over my forgeries. This hand, this eyelid, this piece by piece abandonment of a plan of escape. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. I mean, this has been a terrific opportunity uh, for Moonstone and Philly Loves Poetry uh, because uh, this is really an exquisite book of poetry and I can't recommend it enough to my, to the viewers out there. So thank you so much. I mean, Frankly speaking, we could have another show to discuss this book. <laughs> this book. I mean, for me, anyway. Uh, but I, I really appreciate um, you coming on. I, I wanted to do this uh, for a while. And, and I think it's right on time because this has really just recently come out. So yeah. people people can, can, can buy it. Uh, mm -hmm. Whatever way they, they do that. I'm not promoting Amazon, but I guess that's the way you, they can do that. Uh, but thank you again. I thank you to Sergio, as always, to making this technically exquisite for us. Uh, the one thing I want to say before I leave, and I, I say it before, is Moonstone does so much, Moonstone Art Center. I'm the president of the Moonstone Board presently. And Moonstone Arts does so much to advance the love of poetry in the city. But people have to realize that they need support. I mean, they need financial support. So I'm just urging, uh, you know, my our viewers and other people, to go onto the site and look at ways that you can donate to this to continue this wonderful mission of bringing poetry to people in Philadelphia. Hundreds of readings, uh, chat books, anthologies. Now there's going to reach an anthology that's going to come out on the disasters of war, and, which is really fabulous, and the, the poets that are in it are incredible. So. Uh, I, I want to really, uh, you know, thank Moonstone uh, for this, but it's been uh, it's been a great experience tonight for me, and this book is a great experience. So uh, I I can't uh, thank you enough, uh, uh, Cynthia, for being our guest. Thank you so much, Charles, and I can't wait to hang out with you in person soon, like and talk more. And oh my goodness. Yes. The vaccines make it possible. <laughs> Great. All right. Take care. Thank you, everyone.